Thanks, Bobby. I'm Sylvan Zeitlin, and I'm here at RERAWS in Burlington, Vermont, with the Progressive Election Coverage Watch Party. We're hoping to hear from Mi Melissa Alosi, Brian Cena, and possibly other candidates with the Progressive Party. Back to you. Thanks, Bobby. I'm Sylvan Zeitlin, and I'm here at RERAWS in Burlington, Vermont, with the Progressive Election Coverage Watch Party. We're hoping to hear from Melissa Alosi, Brian Brian Cena, and possibly other candidates with the Progressive Party. Back to you in Studio A. Thanks, Bobby. I'm Sylvan Zeitlin, and I'm here at RERAWS in Burlington, Vermont, with the Progressive Election Coverage Watch Party. We're hoping to hear from Brian Cena, Missa Alosi, and possibly other candidates with the Progressive Party. Back to you in Studio A. Um. All right, can you tell me about yourself? Yeah, so Josh Ronsky, I'm the executive director of the Vermont Progressive Party. Yeah. And uh, what, have you, what have you spent your time doing today? Yeah, so I've been running around um, visiting some of the polling locations. I voted myself, um, so it's fun to vote on election day um, to be part of that. And then I was, um, you know, doing a lot of pushing out of, to get out the vote through email and um, social media, so doing a lot of our comms program just to make sure everyone gets the message that it's a really important election today and they have to go vote. Yeah. And uh, as a party a kind of executive, what has the run-up to this election looked like for you in terms of organizing? Yeah, so, you know, we've been supporting um, a few candidates around the state and, you know, what that looks like is um, assisting them with their door knocking and field program. Um, our candidates tend to rely heavily on doing direct outreach through door-to-door -door canvassing of, um, of voters. So we are doing that really aggressively all around Vermont um, this cycle. And you know, my job was to be essentially support that and help them um, have the resources that they needed to really get their message out um, in their districts. What are some kind of results from tonight you're kind of looking for? Yeah. Yeah, so obviously, you know, we support David Zuckerman at the top of the ticket for lieutenant governor. Um, we're really excited. Um, you know, we actually just announced we have 11 um, candidates that have already been, you know, we're already confident they won because they were unopposed. <laughs> um, and that includes Chloe Tomlinson, who is in Winooski and um, is going to be a first-time state rep candidate. Really excited that Tanya Vyhovsky is going back to the state senate. She had a really difficult primary race um, where kind of the business establishment put tens of thousands of dollars to defeat her, but she won that, and then now she is going back to the state senate. So we're really excited about that. We have a few um, house races we're watching as well um, around the state. So yeah, we're, we're and obviously the national, we're not focused on the national election because we're a state-based party, but obviously we're really concerned around, um, you know, what happens in that race and really want to avoid another Trump presidency. Yeah. Well, thank you, Josh. I'm here with Kate Logan. Hi. And uh, I think you have some news. I do. Yes, I was reelected to serve another two years uh, as state representative for the Chittenden 16 district. I represent uh, Central Old North End, downtown, and Pine Maple uh, neighborhoods in Burlington. So uh, now that that kind of big question of the night is answered, um, what are you what are you looking forward to what are you looking to do in the next season you know um i am eagerly waiting to see the results from around the state so i know what the composition of uh, the house of representatives in the senate is going to be um it's really hard to know uh, what i want to accomplish until i know um, who's going to be in there governing with me um, I think the top issues that the legislature needs to address in the next session are housing. Um, we have a desperate need for more housing and emergency shelter, transitional housing, permanent supported housing, you name it. Um, I am not a homeowner and I have a graduate degree and I serve as a state representative and I am the director of a statewide nonprofit and I can't afford to buy a home in my own district. So we need to do something about housing in Vermont. Um, everyday Vermonters are struggling with the cost of living. So, uh, and housing is one of those, the largest expenses that we have. We also need to do something about our utilities costs. So one of the other large expenses, <laughs> uh, sorry, 
Miss Aloisi just walked in, who just who lost her their race today. That's it, back to you. Sorry. I have, let's see, I have a couple more questions to ask. Sweet. I figured. You seem like you were. Um, uh, yeah. Ready? Yeah. So sorry we got interrupted. Um, you can go ahead and continue right where you left Thanks. off. Yeah. I think we need to try to do something about folks' utility bills, especially their heating bills. Um, heating fuel costs too much. We can lower folks' uh, heating bills by giving low and moderate income households help to transition over to electric heat. Um, and, and we've made a commitment to building more renewable energy in the state. Overall, that's going to cost Vermonters less over the long term, so we just need to start making that transition. It's also one of our largest sources of carbon emissions in the state, so we also need to do our part to avoid, you know, climate collapse. Um, and then taxes. We need some tax reform. Um, we're paying middle income. Vermonters are paying too much in taxes. We need to be taxing wealthier Vermonters. They pay an effective tax rate that is lower than middle income Vermonters. And we need revenue to pay for housing and this energy transition. And, um, you know, Folks who are earning more in Vermont um, can afford to pay more, so we need a, a fair taxation system in the state. So those are my top priorities. So obviously we have some results coming in and some things are still unknown, but what do you think Vermonters could uh, look to see if the progressives and the Democrats were to lose the super, super majority tonight? Um, I think it's gonna be a challenge to get anything accomplished. Um, there's a lot, uh, there's a, a pretty huge partisan divide right now, and I'll be honest that I did not see Republicans bringing policy proposals to the table uh, in the last two years, or for years, honestly. I've heard a lot of criticism of the approach that we've taken, but I haven't heard proposals. Um, so I'm gonna be looking to the, our Republican colleagues who have taken uh, the seats of incumbent Democrats um, to come in with some ideas. And I'm happy to work with anybody. I think what we need to be focused on is our goals of saving Vermonters money, um, making this a great place for families to live, um, making it a great place for young people to live. And, um, and, and it's probably gonna be a little bit more contentious I hope we're able to accomplish some things, but I, I fear I fear based on what I've seen from my Republican colleagues that we're going to just um, not be able to come to an agreement on some things. I think it's going to be challenging. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Bobby and Celine. I'm here with Miss Aliosi, and uh, you were running for? Uh, the Chittenden 17 House Representative spot. Yeah, and um, so I, I, I heard that you lost your your race. Correct. Um, but I'm curious about what did you like? What did you learn from this election? What did you learn from this campaign? Yeah, I, I this is my first time into politics, and I learned quite a lot. Um, I really enjoyed a kind of how we can engage people in a new way. Um, I. I um, really was working hard to kind of break down the barriers of how we can engage with information and policy. Um, and I think I did that well in my campaign. Um, and I hope to continue that work in some capacity so that way people can be more engaged in politics. Yeah. What do you think your next steps are moving forward? I'm not sure. I, I, I got a taste of politics and I really like it, so I think I'm going to do it some in some capacity. I'm not really sure what yet uh, next, 
take a little break. Uh, campaigning is a lot of work, um, and we'll figure out what's next. But um, it's probably you'll hear my name again sometime in the future. <laughs> okay, sweet. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for checking in with us. I'm excited to see your speech. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we're all kind of anxiously awaiting a bunch of results, but we have a few results to announce now um, that you know we have candidates here to discuss in the ballot question as well. Before we get into that, though, I do really want to thank all the volunteers and campaign managers. I see a bunch of people here. Like this. Ben, we have Ben from the Manitoba campaign. Amazing job. Um, yeah, who, if, if you worked on a campaign, just raise your hand did anything, like door knocking, voting, yeah. 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 yeah, so thank you so much, yeah, y'all, you know, none of this would happen without all of you, you know, we don't take, we don't have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, most of our campaigns are run on a shoestring budget, and when we win elections, it's because we have grassroots organizers going out, knocking doors, talking to the community, um, and, you know, really breaking through the wave of big money in politics that we saw more than ever before in this election. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, Milo and Jean who are going to talk about the question two that passed in the Burlington ballot. Woohoo! I'm gonna start and gonna turn it over to Milo um, after a, a few short things, but. Can you tell us the numbers? Yes, yes, I would tell you the numbers, but let me just say, we won a victory. I'll give you the um, the percentages, and then we can talk to numbers a little bit. 62.4% versus 37.5%. Wow. I mean, I happen to have supported the, um, the, the ballot initiative the last time. The, the independent, and I didn't think that this went far enough, but I thought it was worth doing. And I have to say that we beat them today as bad as they beat us. And what that what that says, they put in, at talking about what Josh said, tens of thousands of dollars to defeat a proposal for community oversight over our police department um, in, last year, and we did not give up. One of the things which is so essential is to understand this long arc. Dr. King talked about the, long, the moral arc of the universe being long, but it bends towards justice. This arc, oh, it started really a long time ago, but in our town, in our city, 2019, 2020 was really a start where people said, we are not going to let the police police that we are not gonna let them beat the crap out of people without having some responsibility and we need community oversight. It has taken us a whole bit of time. There are a lot of compromises that we made in this ballot item. There was a lot of work that we did to make sure that we really did reflect the community. But in the end, what we showed is that 11,395 people in the city of Burlington versus 6,849 people think that a community has the right to oversee their police department so that it respects human rights and human <coughs> dignity and that none of us, none of our communities, none of our people can just be treated in the way that they have been in the past. And I am just really, really grateful to all the people here who voted yes for that, all the people who stood with us in this struggle and will continue to because this is an arc which is very long and we have to continue to bend it. It will not bend itself. We will only bend it if we, if we bounce on it, if we, bunt, if we pull it, if we do all the things that are necessary to make sure that we're constantly going to justice. So I am just so pleased with us, with you. Will you say the numbers one more time? 11,395 yes to 6,849. Wow. 
That was a huge victory. Sister. Uh, this is, this whole thing has been very emotional for me. A lot of you know that I used to serve on the police commission. Um, the idea that was being put forth that people who volunteered couldn't do this work, couldn't understand police work. Quite frankly, if you can read, and you can read in a directive that you shouldn't swear at people, the average person can understand that. Douglas Kilburn is dead because an officer swore at him and escalated a situation. We have a department that it, I recommend everybody read the BPOA statement. It just came out tonight. Just came out tonight. Attacking us and saying that they're going to try to defeat it in the legislature because somehow we're doing terrible things to them instead of being very positive to the city. And yet, they cannot talk in a positive way about their own department. The chief of police has said on multiple times, multiple times, that he cannot control how the public feels about the police department. That is a lie. He has relinquished his responsibilities. I have been in places where he talks to the public and members of the public have positive stories about their interactions with our officers. Never does he ask people to do a simple thing like submit a commendation. They were locked out of their Instagram account for the better part of the year. The pillars of 21st century policing say you must use social media and other tools for recruitment and engagement with your community. They do not do that. We have given them $100,000 for recruitment. We have not gotten any report yet with regards to how that money is being spent. The fire department, which also has staffing issues, you don't hear about that, do you? Because they do their job and they do what they need to do. They just did a digital advertising campaign with a cute little video they made in-house saying how great it was to work for the Burlington Fire Department and how great it was to work in the city of Burlington. They put that out, they boosted it, they have metrics that they look at, and they got, what, 16 applicants, 16, two and a half weeks, they got 16 applications with six people qualified to move forward. As of July, mid-July, Burlington Police Department only got a total of 26 applications. Now, that's not who can move forward, that's 26 applications total. And they have no plan. They have no plan. Yet, two and a half weeks of a digital advertising campaign, boosting posts, targeting media that firefighters read, basic one, two, three, ABC stuff, that's what I call it, spent $11.54 on the campaign, that's 11 cents a click. Hello, 11 cents a click. And got those applications in. Now there's no guarantee that the six people who qualified to move forward will end up, but this is an example of the type of work that the police department is not doing. And people don't understand that. And it's important that everybody understand it, and it's important that everybody talk about it and hold them accountable. There are things that they can be doing, a strategic plan to address their online reputation. The YES program, tens of thousands of negative online impressions around the scandal that happened there. Oh, yeah. And I think everyone's familiar with that at the high school? The high school kids. Yeah, yeah. We have multiple lawsuits, including one we just settled for $250,000, and our insurance company is not paying all of it. They're like, uh-uh, taxpayers are on the hook. The Millie Brothers case, $750,000, 
insurance company paid five hundred thousand dollars we paid two hundred and fifty thousand dollars there's a twenty thousand dollar deductible in all these cases that we are hitting and we paid to get rid of a bad officer who was also a training officer and you want to know why we can't pick up picks up their building so these are the things we need to be thinking about everybody needs to be more engaged everybody needs to be talking about this because there is not an innovative idea coming out of that department whereas our fire department is way ahead of the game 60 percent of incidents in our fire department have to do with ems because they are dealing with the overdose crisis so these are things i want you to think about Thank you so much for listening. In many ways, this is only starting because we're already seeing a backlash. They never say what they can do better. Never. Anyone in this room ever heard them say about what they can do better? No. I'll wait. It's a no for me. That's part of the problem. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, that was incredible that we yeah. won that, especially after the, the beat last time around. Um, so yeah, it really goes to show what happens when you just engage in consistent organizing and move moving of our agenda forward. So. Yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Aloisi, who ran an incredible campaign in a really, really tough district. And, you know, we know that uh, she's going to run again at some point, and everyone loses their first race, so got the first one out of the way. So I'm new to politics, as you all know. Um, I think, you know, I got really motivated when Emma became mayor. And I remember, I think Rachel put out an email that said, if not you, then who could run for office? And I thought, well, maybe me. <laughs> and put my hat in the rink. <laughs> um, and then I started to find my voice in politics a little bit more. Um, you know, I really believe in access to things, um, and that's how I lead my architecture practice. And so I kind of applied my knowledge there to politics. And, you know, all the, the things that I kind of dived in into policy was like, how can I get more people engaged with policy? Because I think there's this disconnect with information and then how we can engage with it. So I kind of took my, my skill set in my visual thinking and, and try to, to create these policy panels, which I think was really helpful for people to understand how these important issues like affordability and community safety and climate change are all connected um, and lay out that data in a clear, simple way so that way we can engage with it. So I got excited about that. I'm still excited about that. I don't know what's in the future, but um, I hope to continue that work in some capacity. I also really am very grateful for the Progressive Party. I knew nothing about politics when I came into it, and there were so many people to just right there ready to lift me up um, and teach me the ropes and kind of guide me along the process. And I'm just so grateful for that, um, including guiding my campaign manager who is also new to politics too um, because <laughs> because a campaign will take as much energy as you give it and <laughs> um, so it's exhausting and we're tired right now but um, I'm very proud of the work that we've done and the the relationships that we've no regrets and the relationships that we've built and we'll continue to build those relationships um, over the next few years and I'm excited about what the future will hold so thank you for supporting me yeah <laughs> Thanks, Miss. Uh, yeah, and then we'll turn it over to Kate Logan, who is going to be returning to the State House this year. Um, and I'm so excited. We're also excited about what she's going to do with the House Progressive Caucus. So. Thank you. Hey, 
So it's really hard to follow up Missa. Um, I, um, I think one of the things that Missa said that I think is so unique about progressives running for and winning office is all of us. Um, we know each other. We show up for each other. Um, we're building a movement and a political revolution that is um, all of us. We know each other. We know what we're fighting for. We're fighting for the working class. We're fighting for justice for everyone. And it's hard work. And it is slow work because we're also up against um, you know, the status quo that has become quite hegemonic. And in a, in a year like this where people have a lot of fear and there are some really, really difficult things going on in the world. People are clinging to what they know and security. And it's just like a little bit harder to have those transformative conversations that we need to be having with people in order to move them into voting a different way than, um, than, and, than they're used to. Anyhow, I um, am so grateful for folks like Missa because I think if I've, I've been uh, canvassing for Missa, that's how Missa and I met was when I volunteered to cam um, canvass for them um, at the beginning of their campaign. And um, this is like, it can be fast. Uh, it can be, we can build these relationships quickly in our communities, but it takes a lot of work uh, and a lot of people to do it that way. Anyhow, I am extremely grateful for the work that has been done in Burlington, Vermont for decades that made it possible for me to jump in to a race two years ago and win a primary with hundreds of votes over my opponent. Um, and be able to go into the state house and make a really, really, you know, really big difference in the in the places where we were making policy. I have to say that this tonight actually is going to make a huge difference for what we're able to accomplish in the next two years in Vermont. And it's going to be, it's like, it's going to be challenging. And so. I'm asking all of you to be ready for the next two years. We're gonna have to get into Vermont. We're gonna have to have conversations with our neighbors. We're gonna have to get out of Burlington. We're gonna have to talk to people all over the state of Vermont in order for us to be able to um, create a Vermont where people can afford to live and have the justice that they deserve and, and can thrive in our state. We're gonna have a bigger problem at the national level, obviously. I'm a little preoccupied by these results, but anyhow, I am super grateful um, to be a progressive. I'm thankful for every single one of you, and I am super psyched to represent us in the State House for the next two years. Um, Troy Hedrick also won his race. He gives his regrets that he couldn't be here tonight. Um, Brian Chino will be here to talk with you later tonight as well. Um, really excited to have Chloe join us in the Progressive Ca House Progressive Caucus next year. And <laughs> Winooski, yeah. Um, and so we, we've already started meeting and talking about the kind of caucus that we want to have next year and we are going to be extremely vocal and we're going to be communicating um, oh, here's Brian. Um, and we're going to be um, like really working on making sure that we can communicate progressive ideas about state policy to the people who should be in our base. And we're going to keep building until the next election and the next election and the next election in Vermont. So I hope you stick with us and get ready to fight for Vermont for years to come, because we're just getting started. We've got a good group of people here who've already been at it for a while now. All right, thanks everybody. Um, yeah, so Brian's here. Do you want to speak now or? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah, so, so Brian Chia just arrived. So Brian. Well, I've been over there, but anyway. Yeah, Brian. <laughs> So yeah, Brian just won. Was it your first, fourth, third, fifth? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yep.
So, so excited to have Brian returning. Um, yeah, Brian, if you want to say a few words. A few words. Um, so um, I can only stay a little bit because on Tuesday nights at 10 o'clock, the People's Kitchen has been feeding people in the park, up to 100 people at a time. There's at least... <laughs> There's at least 350 people counted who are unsheltered in Burlington, but we know there's hundreds more in a humanitarian crisis that is being manufactured by the policies of a governor who is not spending the money that he's been appropriated to take care of people. And, yeah, and they're driving them into, the, into the, the towns and cities that are democratic and progressive led to, to further this narrative that these anti-policing progressive policies, which are actually police accountability policies are causing the crime but the the reality is that the the our way of life has never properly and like equitably provided for the social determinants of health crime and crime that the social determinants like housing access to health care food economic security social opportunity inclusion i could go on there's many that we have failed to provide these to the people and that We've, we, there's an economic system, a social system, a way of life that perpetuates inequity. And during the pandemic, we temporarily ended ho unsheltered homelessness. And we had an opportunity for four years to make a plan. And the governor has been given many plans by myself, other, by other legislators, advocates, activists, even from unhoused people, and ignores them and continues to spend money in fiscally and moral, morally irresponsible ways. And so now what we see is a humanitarian crisis that, it, I'm sorry, it's upsetting. Every, every Tuesday I come here, I see people getting closer to death. I see people getting sicker, infections that are preventable, people losing limbs, people o overdosing and needing eight Narcans to come back because of the, the blends of the drugs now. And what they need is a safe place to be, to start. They're asking for sanctuary. And, I, and they say, we know that we are hurting others because we're stealing, but like we're, this is the first meal anyone's offered us today. So when we steal food and tampons and medicine, we're doing it because we have to, and then when people are mean to us, yes, we act out. And I'm hearing stories about people peeing on them in the morning to wake them up and pouring maple syrup on them, women, pregnant women getting kicked in the stomach, women waking up with fake blood or red stuff on their crotches and they have no other clothes. People, I'm gonna stop because I don't want to give you the trauma that I'm getting from hearing this stuff, so I'm being mindful of that. But this is completely unacceptable. And Martin Luther King said violence begets violence and the state violence is driving the violence. And so I just, this is what's on my mind. And at, at, at 10 o'clock, if you're still around, between 10 and 11, we'll be right outside that window um, feeding people. And we've been inviting house neighbors to join us because people have said that, some people have said, this is the first time anyone has been kind to me. And they, and they said it means a lot, even though they're suffering, that there's anyone who cares. And, I'll just tell you one more little story about this and then kind of wrap it up because you said a few words and it's becoming like um, many words, but um, that um, <clears throat> we also do a food distribution at South Meadow, which is a housing project in Burlington. And when and uh, one of the women there is a lunch lady or she gave me the, the, the term they use now. It's not I'm sorry, that's offensive now. It's something like um, kitchen worker. I can't remember, but. Uh, but I say it with respect. Like, she works in the kitchen at a school. Food gets wasted. She said, would you want to use it? And some of the kids, like nine-year-olds, were like, who's it for? And I told them. And they said, there's people who don't have houses and homes. That's not right. And these little kids helped us. And when I told them the story of how, you know, we're the ones here, but there's others who do care who just can't be here, they said... It means so much. And when I told the kids, now the kids every week ask about them and give stuff for them. So we need to do this kind of thing at a mass scale. We need to create amnesty and sanctuary for everyone. And then from that place, we need to solve this housing crisis and go further. We can build, as we build the housing we need, we can address energy production locally, waste management, food production. We really need to look at all the social determinants and the investments we make. And so to wrap it up, I'll say that the Progressive Caucus has been an outspoken voice and has moved the needle. It has, it pre we prevented these evictions for a year and we did what we could this time. But right now it's a crisis and um, 
you know, we need a strong progressive caucus. We need st um, strong progressive allied candidates. But what we need more than that are neighbors. We need everyone out there to think of er anyone around us as neighbors. Stop othering others. And so I call upon, like, uh, members of the party and sort of our, our uh, friends, our associates, our progressive adjacents, is that, you know, adjacents to us, to do everything you can to, to show kindness to whatever degree you can. And I'll end with, with one ask. The one thing that's sorely needed right now is winter coats. And all the agencies are out of money. The governor's holding it back. So he's not even giving the agencies money. So um, if people have coats that are gently worn and warm, you can uh, contact me through the Progressive Party, and I might even like send out some emails about this because we really need them fast. Like, there's been some nights where I saw 70 people sharing three blankets, shivering, and had to leave them like that. And like, this is just unacceptable in a society where there's so much wealth. And so I could go on, but thank you all, and um, you know, I look forward to. I'm sorry to those of you who aren't going to be joining us in the state house, but I hope we can work together anyway. Because like I said, it, we're a small but mighty caucus, but what really has always made a difference is when we organize with people outside the building. Anything we achieve has come through that organizing, and that's what we really need to do is change the way we live and share this earth together. So thank you for listening. All right. Hi, I'm here with uh, Brian Cena. Yeah. Chino. Chino. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I was supposed to ask before I started this. I'm here with Brian Chena. Um, yeah, tell me what you just won. Oh, I, I just uh, won my fifth election as a state representative. So this will be, um, I've done eight years, so I'll be doing my ninth and tenth year starting in 2025. And, and um, at this point, I'm the senior progressive member of the House. Congratulations. And... Uh, could you tell me some of your priorities looking in forward into this election? My, no, my main priority right now is, is, is addressing the housing crisis. That The housing crisis is driving many of the, our greatest problems and it's causing this, the systems of government to spend a lot of money on those problems. And if we were focused on building a continuum of housing with pu public and private options, where everyone is housed and sheltered in some capacity, that that alone would save us massive amounts of money. For example, it might cost, it, in the current market in Burlington, if you're lucky, a thousand a bedroom, probably more. Well, one night in the emergency room is three to four thousand dollars, and if someone doesn't have insurance or is on Medicaid, that, that's getting eaten by the system. And so, what you see is people who are un, unhoused and unsheltered ending up in the emergency room a few times a month, that that might be enough to house them for a year. And so that's one example of how the lack of housing is driving up healthcare costs. It's, 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 and then to compound that, in the current situation, we have people being evicted from motels due to policy decisions by the governor that the legislature did not agree to. We gave funding and a directive to create a transition from the emergency program to shelters and housing. He's setting arbitrary caps and causing hundreds of people to be out in the streets and in the woods and hiding in cars. You know, most of them are out of sight because of safety concerns. They get regularly attacked. And also people feel ashamed when they're in that position. And so they, they, many do stay out of the public eye. And the, the, um, that, that policy of withholding money and creating unsheltered homelessness is creating costs in other parts of the system that are going to get us down the road. So like addressing the housing crisis by creating a, many options for cooperative ownership, individual and family home ownership, public housing and private housing for rent. And, um, and a, one piece of it, one specific piece would be tax incentives and penalties to create affordable rent. So one, one thing, idea that I'm going to pursue in the next session that I've brought up in the past but it hasn't gotten enough attention is we set a range for affordability for, for housing in each area. And then we say, if you charge your tenant within that range, you pay normal taxes. If you give them a break down to a certain point, you get a break. And it, you go over it to a certain point, your taxes go up to the point where when you cross that line, your, all of your profit gets taken. 
So it creates an incentive for landlords to either give a break or make a little extra and take a hit or stay within the range and keep rent affordable. But right now, what we're seeing is one case, person evicted from motel. Their family takes them in because they don't want their loved one on the street. Because they take a person in and they have a voucher, they lose their voucher and they're evicted. And then the landlord makes the rent go from 1800 to 2400 for a two bedroom and doesn't take housing vouchers anymore. So now one person becomes six on the street and that apartment is less accessible to many of the workers and, and students in the city. So we really need to address the supply. We need to build the housing that, uh, in ways that address people's needs better. Then we need to find ways to control the cost of rent. Um, and when we build the housing, I'll say this too, we can integrate localized waste management. So we reduce the environmental in impact. We can build the housing so the infrastructure itself produces energy for that housing so that there's no carbon footprint. We can build agricultural production into the housing. We can build spaces for people to gather, which promotes inclusion and belonging, which is an important social determinant of health. So if we address the housing crisis in a, a smarter way, an intersectional way, that investment in the immediate need of housing will play out down the road in savings on energy, waste management, food for the people. And we really need to be thinking this way right now um, about um, how do we solve many problems as we solve this big problem, the housing crisis. So that's my number one priority. There's more, but I don't want to take up too much space. I could say a little, a little bit about the other things, but that is, okay. So um, another one is artificial intelligence. So the single greatest threat to our existence right now is artificial intelligence. And this is not paranoia. Um, the, when I was, uh, my first year in the legislature, I introduced a bill that people mocked, and then in the second year it passed. It was the first in U.S. history on the state level to take action on AI. We created a task force. I served on it, fought for our recommendations to be passed, and it, they were. And then this thing, uh, Vermont created a division of AI, an AI council, a code of ethics, um, an inventory of how the state uses AI, and then ultimately... Um, there's clapping for someone who just came in. I'll finish this so you can t hear them. So now they call it the Vermont model and many states are adopting this approach. So this is not paranoia. AI is a crucial issue affecting our, the, uh, what it's gonna mean to be human. The next um, sort of frontier is in healthcare that we are years away from implants and you can look this up online. Neuralink is the company, Elon Musk's company. They're, they've been able to interface circuits with neurons in rats and now in humans. So we're a few years away from this rolling out. It's going to be miraculous for many people. They're going to be able to walk again. They're going to have problems fixed, disabilities addressed. But if we do not approach it correctly, our mental privacy will be threatened. Our, the data in our, of our brains will be just like our data is bought and sold on phones. If we don't approach it, we're going to lose that. And there's also the possibility that companies could use that to influence our behavior. So one of the important bills for me as a member of the healthcare committee is gonna be looking at mental privacy and, like, and creating some measures to set an example for the country of how do we use the benefits of that technology without letting it um, take us down a road we don't wanna go down um, that would jeopardize like, um, our privacy and honestly our, our human rights. Um, a few other things is universal health care, um, alternatives to incarceration, building a regenerative circular economies around the state. Um, so those are a few of my priorities, but the number one is going to be addressing the housing crisis in an intersectional way and addressing the current humanitarian crisis of unsheltered homelessness that we're seeing in Vermont. So thank you for interviewing me. I'll stop now because we probably want to hear from Chloe. Yeah, so. thank you so yeah. much. I had more questions, but I think you answered them all. all. So thank you, Brian Chena, right. and congratulations you. on your fifth election. You. And uh, I have Chloe Tomlinson with me, and she just won. So what can you tell me? I'm so grateful to have the trust of voters in Winooski, and it was amazing to see the turnout today. It was just incredible. Um, it seemed like it was uh, close to a record-breaking turnout, higher than we've seen in a really long time. So just great to see folks really engaged in um, our democracy. And you were at the polling place today? 
Yeah, I was at the polling place as much as I could be. I was also working. Um, so um, in the morning and then for lunch and, and after um, and after work, which was when a lot of folks were showing up. There was even a line um, at the beginning of the day at 7 a.m. So yeah, there were a lot of folks there. Yeah. And uh, what are some of your priorities? What are some of your goals? Moving into this, moving into this legislation. Yeah, so really, my top priority and what I've heard the most from constituents is around housing. Um, so both renter protections, and we're really keen to work on advancing uh, the charter change for just cause eviction that's in the state that was already sent to the legislature, um, and even considering um, expanding that policy to a statewide model, um, and also looking at ways that we can address our, our crunch in housing by developing more permanently affordable housing for folks, both to rent and also pathways to ownership. And to kind of shift topics here, what do you think some of the repercussions specifically on Vermont and Vermonters would be as a result of any outcome in the national election tonight? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, um, I think we have to, uh, what's really most important is that people are engaged on the local level and um, folks are aware of what's happening in their, you know, town and state level governments because ultimately we can, it's really important that Vermonters are showing up for each other no matter what happens. And I think there's a great example of um, Prop 5 that was passed in the legislature um, it, that is enshrining uh, reproductive rights into the Constitution. There's more things we can look into along those lines to make sure, regardless of what's happening on the national level, that in Vermont we're protecting people's basic human rights. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Yeah, thank yeah. you.